Porters moved in circles, trying to record everything that was happening. No one noticed a small window on the third floor of the courthouse. It opened slowly, and from the darkness, a firebomb was thrown. It landed perfectly at Stump's feet and exploded. Immediately, the clan leader's long white robe went up in flames. Stump Sisson was having his five minutes of fame. The violence which followed the firebomb was the worst there had ever been in the small town. Blacks and whites fought with their hands, sticks, and knives, not stopping until Aussie Walls and his deputies fired their guns in the air. When things became quieter, Aussie went to the town hall. He asked the leader of the town council to contact the governor. He wanted the National Guard to be called in. As sheriff, he felt the situation was out of control, and he needed the army to help keep order. Clanton had seen nothing like it before. Jake, Ellen Rourke, Harry Rex, and Lucian spent the rest of the week preparing for the trial. They had two main jobs. The first was to find the people who would make the best jury for Carl Lee. They studied the list of names again and again, trying to decide which ones to choose. They knew that Buckley would look for an all-white jury that would find Carl Lee guilty. They needed to get some black people on the jury, but they also knew it would be difficult because there were so few blacks in Clanton. The second job was to prepare Carl Lee's insanity defense. This was Ellen's responsibility. By the end of the week, Jake knew the names and life histories of every person on the jury list, and Ellen had given him a thick file which contained everything he needed to present a strong insanity defense. He knew that he should feel confident, but he became more and more nervous as the first day of the trial came nearer. Maybe it was the burning crosses that the clan had put outside the houses of twenty of the people whose names were on the jury list. Maybe it was the late nights he was spending with Lucian, Harry Rex, and Ellen, and the large amounts of alcohol they all seemed to be drinking. Maybe it was just the fact that this was the biggest, most important trial he had ever worked on, that he had very little money, that his wife and daughter had had to leave town, and that his wife was still not speaking to him. On the morning of Monday, July 22nd, the day they were going to choose the jury, Jake woke up in his office before the sun, feeling terrible after another late night and too much whiskey. Harry Rex came early with breakfast. Jake could not eat his, so Harry Rex ate for the two of them. Ellen arrived a little later, dressed in a dark gray suit. Harry Rex told her, that it was the first time she looked like a lawyer. As the sun rose, the National Guard started to move around the court building. Soldiers stood at each corner of the courthouse square, watching the groups of reporters, black people, and Klan members who had started to arrive. As soon as they saw the white masks, the black people started to shout, Free Carl Lee! Free Carl Lee! The clan replied by screaming back, Fry Carl Lee! Fry Carl Lee! Soldiers carrying guns ran across the square and stood between the two groups. By the time the buses carrying the possible jury members arrived, Jake felt terrible. When he was still a young lawyer, Lucian had told him to make friends with fear, because it would never go away. Lucian had also said that the jury always listened to a lawyer who was brave enough to be himself. Jake knew about the fear, but was not sure if he wanted to be himself. His head ached too much. How are you, boss? Ellen asked. Ready, I guess. We'll leave in a minute. 
There were some reporters waiting outside. I told them you would drop the case and left town. Wouldn't that be nice? Jury selection was a long and complicated process. 114 people had been asked to do their duty as citizens. The 20 who had had a burning cross in their yards were told that they need not stay. That left 94 names. Each lawyer then had the right to interview each juror. Buckley began with a list of a thousand questions. When Noose stopped him at five o'clock, he had still not finished. He said he would finish in the morning. The next day, the sun rose quickly. A morning mist hung over the ground, wetting the boots of the soldiers outside the courthouse. By the time breakfast was served, the day was already hot, and the soldiers had taken off their jackets and stood around in their pale green undershirts. The black church leaders and their followers returned to their part of the square, and the clansmen kept together on their side. It was 9 a.m. of day two. Jake had a difficult job to do after Buckley's three-hour questioning the day before. His first question showed that he wanted to simplify things. Ladies and gentlemen, do any of you believe that the insanity defense should not be used in a murder trial? The possible jurors looked at each other, but no hands went up. Insanity. Insanity. The seed had been planted. If we prove that Carl Lee Haley was legally insane when he shot Billy Ray Cobb and Pete Willard, is there a person here who cannot find him not guilty? The question was hard to follow. That was the way Jake wanted it. Again, there were no hands. A few wanted to answer, but they were not sure how to. Jake looked at them carefully. He knew that most of them were confused, but he also knew that for this moment, every possible juror was thinking about his client being insane. He would leave them there. Thank you, he said, with all the charm he could manage. I have no more questions. Buckley looked confused. He stared at the judge. Is that all? Noose asked. Is that all, Mr. Briggins? Yes, sir. These citizens look fine to me, Jake said. The group was not at all acceptable to Jake. Too white too many women. But there was no sense repeating the same questions Buckley had asked. Now that the list of possible jurors had been agreed, the next stage of jury selection could begin. Judge Noose and the lawyers left the courtroom and sat at the table in the judge's office. Noose looked at his numbered list and then looked at his lawyers. Gentlemen, are you ready? Good. Since this is a murder case, each of you has the right to refuse to accept twelve of the jurors. Mr. Buckley, you must now give a list of twelve jurors to the defense. Please start with juror number one and refer to each juror only by number. As they worked through the selection process, it became clear that Jake's worst fears were coming true. Buckley repeatedly suggested white jurors who were clearly against Carl Lee. Jake could not say no to them all. Twelve was the limit. So he found himself accepting people he knew would be against his client. And each time Jake offered one of the few jurors he really wanted, Buckley refused him or her. The numbers were on Buckley's side. For every juror that Jake thought might be good for Carl Lee, Buckley had ten who would be against him. When the last juror had been chosen, Judge Noose and the lawyers returned to their places. His honor called the names of the twelve, and they slowly, nervously made their way to the jury box. Ten women, 
two men, all white. The blacks in the courtroom looked at each other in disbelief. Did you pick that jury? Carl Lee asked Jake. Stump Sisson died on Tuesday night at the Burns Hospital in Memphis. Four people had now died as a result of the rape of Tanya Haley. Cobb, Willard, Bud Twitty, and now Sisson. When the clan members met in the woods that evening, they wanted revenge. Stump Sisson would be remembered. Around midnight, Jake walked up and down his office and gave his opening speech for the hundredth time. Ellen listened. She had listened, objected, criticized, and argued for two hours. She was tired now. He did it perfectly. When he finished, they went to the window and watched the lights being held by the blacks sitting in the darkness of the square. They could hear laughter from the card games and the soldiers' tents. There was no moon. Chapter 11 The Trial Begins The bus arrived at the courthouse five minutes before nine. The jurors looked out through darkened windows to see how many blacks and how many clansmen were waiting, and how many National Guard soldiers. When Judge Noose was ready to start, they were led into the courtroom and then into the jury box. Rufus Buckley, as prosecutor, had the right to speak first, and he clearly intended to enjoy every minute. He started by thanking the jurors for being there, as if they had a choice, thought Jake. He said he was proud to be working with them in this most important case. Jake sat and listened. It was all garbage, and he had heard it before, but it still annoyed him, because the jury sometimes believed it. Then Buckley started to talk about the rape and how terrible it was. He said that he was a father, too. In fact, he had a daughter the same age as Tanya Haley, but that no one could take the law into their own hands. Jake smiled quickly at Ellen. This was interesting. Buckley had chosen to talk about the rape instead of keeping it from the jury. Jake had been expecting a problem with Buckley when it came to this topic. Normally, it would not be accepted as evidence during a murder trial, especially the more unpleasant details. But now, Buckley had introduced the subject, so he was not going to be able to object when Jake told the jury about what the murdered men had done and how the rape had destroyed Tanya's life and the life of Carl Lee Haley. The next mistake that Buckley made was to speak for too long. Although he had started with the jury on his side, by the end they were bored and finding it difficult to stay awake. Jake was winning the first argument without saying a word. Jake had already planned a short opening speech, and after Buckley's effort, he decided to make it even shorter. He only spoke for fourteen minutes, and the jury liked every word. He began by talking about daughters and how special they are. He told them about his own daughter and the special relationship that exists between father and daughter. He started to tell them how he would feel if she was raped by two drunk, drugged animals who tied her to a tree and... Objection! shouted Buckley. Sustained! News shouted back. Jake ignored the shouting and continued softly. He asked the jury to try to imagine, through the whole trial, how they would feel if it was their daughter. He asked them not to find Carl Lee guilty, but to send him home to his family. He didn't talk about insanity yet. They knew it was coming. He finished shortly after he started and left the jury with a strong sense of the difference between the two lawyers. Is that all? Noose asked in surprise. Well then, Mr. Buckley, you may call your first witness. The state calls Nora Cobb. 
The mother of the murdered rapist sat in the witness box and listened to Rufus Buckley as he asked her where she lived and what had happened on the day her son, Billy Ray Cobb, was killed. As Nora Cobb told her story, she started to cry. She was not a witness who could do much damage to Carl Lee, and normally Jake would not ask her any questions. But then he saw an opportunity he could not miss. He could wake up Judge Noose and start making the jury think about what people like Billy Ray Cobb were really like. He also felt that Nora Cobb's tears were the result of good acting, not deep regret. Just a few questions, Jake said as he stood up. Mrs. Cobb, is it true that your son sold drugs? Objection, Buckley shouted, jumping to his feet. The criminal record of the victim cannot be mentioned in court. Sustained. Mrs. Cobb wiped her eyes and started to cry harder. You say your son was 23 when he died. In his 23 years, how many other children did he rape? Objection! Objection! shouted Buckley again, waving his arms and looking desperately at Judge Noose. Sustained! Sustained, Mr. Briggins! You cannot ask these questions! Mrs. Cobb burst into tears, and the sound of her crying filled the shocked courtroom. But Jake had made his point. The jury would now remember the sort of man Billy Ray Cobb had been. The next witness was Ernestine Willard, the mother of the other victim. She was less of an actress than Mrs. Cobb, but Rufus Buckley asked her the same questions he had asked the first witness and brought the same tears to her eyes. When he had finished, Jake stood up. Mrs. Willard, I'm Jake Briggins. He stood in front of her and looked at her without pity. How old was your son when he died? Twenty-seven. Buckley pushed his chair from the table and sat on its edge, ready to jump up. Noose removed his glasses and leaned forward. During his twenty-seven years, how many other children did he rape? Buckley immediately shouted, Objection! 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 Sustained! 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 The shouting frightened Mrs. Willard, and she cried louder. But, once again, Jake had made his point. Ozzy was the first state witness after lunch. Buckley questioned him first, asking him to repeat exactly what had happened on the day of the murder. He then showed Ozzy the gun that Carl Lee had used and asked him to say if this was the one he had found near the bodies. To finish, he then brought out a set of color photographs of the murder victims some taken so close you could see how the bullets had broken through the skin and bone. Rufus Buckley made the jury members look at each picture, pointing out the horror of the way the two men had died. He wanted them to remember the violence of what Carl Lee had done. Jake looked at his notes as he walked across the courtroom. He had just a few questions for his friend. Sheriff, did you put Billy Ray Cobb and Pete Willard in jail? Yes, I did, answered the sheriff. For what reason? For the rape of Tanya Haley. And how old was she at the time of the rape? She was ten. Is it true, Sheriff, that Pete Willard signed a written document saying that he had raped Tanya Haley? Objection! Objection! Your Honor! We can't discuss this case, and Mr. Briggins knows it. Ozzie had already said yes. Sustained. Please ignore the last question from Mr. Briggins, Noose told the jury. No further questions, said Jake. The next two witnesses gave technical evidence to show that Carl Lee Haley had, as everyone knew, killed Cobb and Willard. Again, Buckley bored the jury by going into great detail 
and asking long and complicated questions. The jury members were becoming increasingly tired of the sound of his voice. When it was Jake's turn to ask questions, he said that he had none. The second day of the trial started in the same way, with the jurors in their seats by nine o'clock. Rufus Buckley brought in his next witness, the doctor who had examined Cobb and Willard's bodies. Again, Buckley talked too long and asked too many questions. No one was denying that Cobb and Willard had been killed with an M16 